Now, those of you who have attended have had the wisdom to attend any of Davies and my Gita classes can guess what might be in here. But the rest of you. <laughs> this represents Om, represents the sound of the universe, and most especially You're in the. Need to be by the mic because there's not. Okay, and. Yeah, no, I'm going to move away. <laughs> and most especially in the Bhagavad Gita, it represents the call to the soul's qualities to awaken and to do battle. So... So now that we're awake, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father Divine, Mother, Divine Mother, Friend Beloved God, friend, beloved God Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Babaji, Krishna, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Mahashaya Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Guru, Guru Paramahansa Yogananda Ji, Saints of all religions. We humbly bow to you all. We humbly bow to you all. Bless, us Bless us with sincere dedication. With sincere dedication. Help us to offer our lives, Help us to offer our lives. Without, reservation. without reservation into thy great light and joy, into thy great light and, joy. and to serve as channels, serve as channels. Of, thy love of thy love to all mankind. To all mankind. We are thine. We are be thou ours. Be thou ours. Om. Peace. Peace. Amen. Thank you all. This is the last day of the three lectures that Davy and I will do. Um, tomorrow there will be a panel on how to live in God. Tonight at Crystal Hermitage at 730, uh, 745, there will be questions and answers. Uh, we're not going to say who's going to do the questions and who's going to do the answers. <laughs> but if you show up, you'll find out. So this morning, I'm going to talk about uh, the pilgrim vows especially, but the vows of the new renunciate order that Swamiji has founded. And then Devi is going to talk about uh, the 14 points that Swamiji lists in his book uh, renunciate order for the new age. Uh, the 14 points that he lists in that book that are the qualities of a renunciate. So coming to the vows, I want to talk a little bit about vows and their importance in our life. When Swamiji first met Master, you all know the story, he read the autobiography in New York, got <laughs> virtually the next bus across the country, uh, traveled uh, for three days and then went and semi-miraculously was able to have an interview with Master. During that very interview, as soon as Master was able to connect with Swamiji, he uh, said to Swami that the only reason he saw him on that day was that Divine Mother told him to see him. He, uh, there were long periods of silence, Swami said, where Master was kind of looking up into the spiritual eye, 
reading his soul, reading his karma. And finally, toward the end of that interview, he said, you have very, you have good karma. I will accept you into the order. And at that point, two hours after or an hour after meeting Master, Swamiji took his vows. So that taking of the vows, the setting of your life with full energy and full dedication toward the goal of, in this case, the goal of finding God, is extremely important. Master said that for most people, their words are like paper bullets shot out of a toy gun, that they just don't have very much power. But the words that are backed by the full consciousness, the full willpower of the devotee, and especially as the devotee matures into more and more, one could say, a core axis of being aligned with the universe, then the words of a devotee of that nature have the power of the universe behind them. We've all read the story in the autobiography of Sri Teshwar's little interchange with Lahiri Mahashaya. As you remember, Lahiri Mahashaya, of course, was Sri Teshwar's guru. And Sri Teshwar had a friend who was very ill. And so he came to um, Lahiri and asked for Lahiri's intercession for his friend's health. And Lahiri agreed that he would intercede and ask Divine Mother on behalf of Sri Yukteswar, but Sri Yukteswar's friend, uh, to, to heal him. So Sri Yukteswar went back to his friend with this news and found him even worse than he was before. And so he came back to Lahiri, basically, what is going on? Uh, my friend is even worse. And Lahiri said, it is no more possible for your friend to die than for the sun and the moon to interchange their places. Uh, Sri Yukteswar goes back to his friend, and his friend is dead. <laughs> Doesn't seem to make much sense. So Sri Yukteswar comes back, and he's quite agitated and upset. And... Um, Lahiri just is kind of casual. He doesn't take him very seriously. Finally, he says, well, if you need medicine, go take some oil out of that lamp and take it back and put it on your friend's lips. And so Sri Yukteswar does that, goes back, puts the oil on his friend's lips, and his friend sits up from apparent death and is instantaneously healed. Well, now, finally, Sri Yukteswar comes back quite chagrined at his lack of faith. And Lahiri says with a twinkle in his eye, he said, I guess Divine Mother found it more convenient to keep your friend alive than to have to shift the moon and the sun <laughs> in their orbits. And of course it's an amusing tale, but the fact of the matter is that the word of a master of that caliber is indeed binding upon the universe because when one becomes absolutely fixed in truth and one speaks from that level of conviction, then the power of the universe is behind that speech. Now, in our taking of the vows, obviously we can't take them from that deep, deep, deep level of absolute conviction. But what we can do is we can take these vows from the deepest level of our own conviction. And that is very, very important. I want to read just a little bit from Swami's chapter on the vows of renunciation. He said, starts out, this is chapter 17. For those of you who have not read the uh, his little short book, uh, Renunciate Order for the New Age, you can go on ananda.org and uh, look for the Renunciate Order there, Naya Swami Order, and you'll find not only the complete text of this book, 
but a lot of other supporting material um, to help you go deeper in this um, in, in attunement with this. But I'll read a little bit from here. Any pledge one's, one takes, what to speak of any vow, should have the force behind it of personal conviction. A mere pledge states, I'm not yet certain, for I don't fully know myself in these matters, but this is the direction I would like to take. A vow should have more force behind it than a pledge. The vow of brahmacharya or tyagi must be backed by sufficient conviction to be able to say, I am sure now this is the direction I want to go, and I will build my life around it. This vow, in other words, implies more than a mere statement, I will try. One has walked the length of the counter and has made his decision. We must always accept the truth, however, that the growth to perfection is directional. It is not a sudden leap from the valley to the mountaintop. Only those who can make such a leap, only those can make such a leap who are highly advanced already and who don't really need any vows at all, for they have already attained the very purpose of those vows. So I want to talk a little bit about the preparation to take vows. So as Swami said, a pledge is important enough, but a vow is very important. He goes on later here to say that, um, that it's actually a spiritual fault to take a vow before you're really ready to take it. Because if you take it without the full conviction of your own consciousness behind it, and then uh, you pull away from that vow early on or later on, then it opens up kind of a darkness. Swami has said in different contexts, and it's very, very good advice to those of you who like to give very, very good advice. <laughs> he said, don't give people advice before they're ready to hear it. Because if you do, the mind will already reject that advice because they aren't ready for it. And having rejected it once, then later on when it would be possible to have uh, an openness in the person to receive good advice, they've already rejected it. And so when you give it later on, it's kind of like, oh, I already heard that already. I don't need to pay any attention. So here we're coming back now to the question of vows. So it's not right to take vows before there's a ripeness to the taking of those vows. In other words, we should have the full conviction of our own mind behind the direction. To put it a little bit, because I think visually, if we were to decide that we're going to drive from here to San Francisco, and we were going to do it with full conviction, we would get in the car and we would drive to San Francisco. That is a vow. You don't stop, you don't dawdle, you don't turn off, you don't stop at the mall in Roseville on the way. <laughs> you just go straight there. Now, there's always the possibility that something is going to happen to divert your travel a little bit. You run out of gas, your tire punctures, whatever. Karma happens, and we have to make an opening. That's why Swami says that vows are also directional. And so that directional uh, quality is there because on the one hand, it's not good to take a vow before you're ready. On the other hand, if you've taken a vow and you slip a little bit in that vow, it's much better just to go on in the direction that you had decided than to say, I've failed, I've made a little slip, I'm no good, I quit. I mean, think of the whole spiritual path. If we who had decided at some point early on in our spiritual search that we wanted to dedicate our life to finding God, 
if every time we slipped a little from that dedication, we decided, well, it's no good, I'm, I'm no good, I think I'll quit, we would have quit, what, two hours into our spiritual path? <laughs> if that. Of course we're going to not be able to completely fulfill uh, the letter of the vow in some cases, but we should not take the vow with the expectation that we aren't going to be able to follow the vow. We should take it with our full conviction. For instance, the Naya Swami b vow starts, I embrace, I, I, from now on, I embrace as the only purpose of my life, the search for God. Now, that is a very definitive and focused statement. Does that mean that for every second after you've made that vow, that you have no other purpose? What's the difference between a purpose and a little interim goal, a little step? That's why it's so helpful that Swami has used this image of the valley and the mountaintop. Of course, it's going to take some steps to get to that mountaintop. And so in this case, from now on, I embrace as the only purpose of my life, the search for God. That's the mountaintop. But if we begin to take the steps and take that vow very, very seriously and focus our life around the steps that will take us to the fulfillment of the vow, then that's the way that we should approach these. So vows are very serious things to take. And because they're serious to take and because they should have the full weight of our own conviction behind them, they are also very, very powerful. And they're great, great aids in our spiritual growth. All of those who are living in the village or have been in the community since the last, I don't know, since around Thanksgiving time when the whole question of taking vows really began became solidified, Davy and I went over to uh, Italy and uh, took the Naya Swami vows at that time, around Thanksgiving time. From before that, when Swami was writing the New Age, uh, 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 Renunciate Order for the New Age, uh, for a couple of months before that, there was an increasing power and focus in the consciousness of people. And then between Thanksgiving and Christmas Eve day, when so many, there were 95 people in this community who took vows at that point, people in various other colonies around took vows at that point. There was, I could feel it, and I'm sure all of you could too, there was a great kind of boost, almost like, the whole spiritual life of the community went to the next octave because that sincere power of the individual taking the vow and then the group magnetism of doing that together and supporting each other in these vows became a very, very powerful spiritual impetus and spiritual bo boost. Now, t tomorrow night, as you know, we're going to have the pilgrim vows. And so I thought I would talk specifically about those vows and then also touch on, on the relationship to the other vows so that Swami, through the course of the years, the decades at Ananda, has had various vows. Those of us who were uh, here in the early years, he had uh, the beginnings of a monastery, but it wasn't the right time. But there were monastic vows. Most of us have taken vows for Kriya. Many of us have taken vows of discipleship. All of those vows have, um, have been here historically at Ananda. Um, about 20 or 25 years ago <coughs> now, uh, we formed the Ananda monastic order. And many of us have taken sevaka vows or sevaka life vows. And all of these vows 
have a certain kind of a relationship. There's a certain pattern to them. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I want to talk now about the pilgrim vows, which we'll be taking tomorrow night. And as our latest count, we were, what, above 90? We're above 100. We're above 100 people taking these vows tomorrow night. So it is a very worthy topic. So <clears throat> the beginning of all of the vows starts with a statement of the purpose of life. And in the pilgrim's vows, it's stated this way. I understand and intend from now on to live by my understanding that life is a pilgrimage of which the final goal is to find and to merge back into God. That's basically the statement that he makes in each of the different vows that he has done. And I'll later on uh, read some of the different things, but it's all, it's as if we're going into a room and that room is the purpose of life. And so entering into that room, we might see a little bit different angle on it, but that same room is there, the purpose of life. He goes on, I will endeavor resolutely, therefore, to direct all my thoughts and actions toward that end. So I'm going to read that again because that's very important. What is being stated here is that from this point on in taking the vow, you're making a promise that this becomes your purpose in life. I understand, I'm going to read them both together. I understand and intend from now on to live by my understanding that life is a pilgrimage of which the final goal is to find and merge back into God. I will endeavor resolutely, therefore, to direct all my thoughts and actions toward that end. Now that is a very, very powerful focus for one's life. Think of all the purposes of life that are in the world. You don't go on, I don't know, uh, any of the networks, ABC, and find the advertisers advertising <laughs> this particular kind of vow or this particular purpose of life. The purpose of life is to be attractive, to be rich, to be healthy, to be powerful. All of the pulls of the world and their diverse expressions for most people are the purpose of their life. And as Master said, all of those purposes have behind it one single motivation. Everybody feels that whatever their purpose in life, that purpose is going to make them happy. Now, it may be a two-step process or a three-step or a ten-step, but nonetheless, we don't start down a road of a purpose without the motivation that it will make us happy or it will help us avoid pain. So maybe the purpose is to work hard, get ahead, be promoted, get rich, one, two, three, four, and then we'll be happy. Or maybe the purpose is to have cosmetic surgery, um, get some sort of uh, beautiful uh, closet full of clothing, and therefore we will be beautiful. Being beautiful, being admired, therefore we will be happy. And so everything, you know, is a stepping, a series of stepping stones toward that one goal of being happy. But what happens is that as we go down that road, every one of those things that seem so rich and verdant in the beginning, so filled with promise and hope, as we proceed farther and farther down, it gets drier and less lively until finally we end in the desert sands of disappointment. And we do that over and over and over again. I enjoyed 
Bharat's Sunday service where he said, Master said that he attracts stubborn people. And he went on to say, let's take as an estimation that we've lived five million lives and we've run into the same wall five million times <laughs> in slight variations. That's stubbornness. <laughs> Reminds me of a joke that we had a friend in the early years of the community, Honnell Cassidy, and this joke came from him. So this man is going to buy a horse from a farmer, and he goes, and the horse is there. It looks good. It looks healthy. Farmer's holding its bridle and saying how, it, how strong the horse is, and then he lets the horse go, and the horse turns, runs smack into the side of a barn. And the f fellow buying the horse says, well, that horse is blind. Farmer says, nah, that horse ain't blind. He just don't give a damn. <laughs> Well, <laughs> laugh now. You're at the five millionth time running into the side of that barn. So, all of those purposes of life, except one, end in disappointment and failure. And finally, to take it seriously, it takes a long, long, long time of trying out different strategies until, as Master said, they take on an anguishing sense of monotony. We have just been down there. One time, Davy and I were walking with Swamiji, and he was, I'm not quite sure how the subject came up, but he was talking about how some people feel kind of inadequate or they feel that he's, you know, with all he's done, it's kind of a special incarnation. He said, I'm not special. I've just been at it a little bit longer than some of you. And that's the truth. You've just been at it. The people in this room, the people ready to take the vows, have been at it a little bit longer from those who are running full tilt toward the side of that barn <laughs> for whatever doorway they perceive being there. So the purpose of life and the only purpose of life is the search for God. I'll read a couple of the other ways that he states it. So we've just heard the pilgrim vows. The Tyagi and Brahmachari says, I understand and fully accept that the true purpose of life for all human beings is to seek God. In pursuit of that goal, I offer my own life unreservedly to seeking my own divine source. For the Naya Swami's already stated it, but it's kind of a little bit simpler. From now on, I embrace as the only purpose of my life the search for God. Now, the Naya Swami order, or the New Renunciate order, is not a part of Ananda. It is associated with Ananda, but think of the, it's really a reformation of the Swami order or the, a renunciate order uh, that originated during Kali Yuga. And the times have changed. And so the statement of what true renunciation needs to change, especially it needs to change into the purpose of renunciation being the dissolution or offering up of the ego. But if you think of the Swami order, there are Swamis in our line, there are Swamis in Shivananda's line, there are Swamis in all kinds of different lines. So the Swami order uh, in India isn't particular to, a per, to any special path. It's for those of any path who want to be renunciates. So at Ananda, we have a, uh, an Ananda monastic order, and it too has vows. And I want to read the Sevaka vow, or these are life Sevaka vows also, because here is another statement <clears throat> of the purpose of life. I offer my life 
and my devotion to God, to you, my line of gurus, and to the ray of the divine light that you represent. And so for the Ananda monastic order, we're still seeking God, but we've pledged to seek it through a particular line of gurus and a particular line of teachings, whereas the New Age uh, Renunciate Order for the New Age is through any line, but still seeking the same goal. Okay, then I uh, will go on to the next section because first there's a statement of the purpose of life. Then Swami talks in each of these vows about the offering up of desires because desires, oh, desire my great enemy, as that chant goes. So he said, I will endeavor, um, excuse me, I will offer up all material desires for purification in the fire of divine bliss. I will offer up all attachments for purification in that cosmic fire. I will search my heart daily for any lingering desires and attachments and will offer them to thee, my cosmic beloved. And so that offering, that's what holds us back, is that the heart's energy, the mind's energy has gone to different desires and different attachments. And those desires and attachments, Master said, you can't find the peace of God, the milk of peace, if your bucket is full of holes. And all those desires and attachments that we carry with us from ancient, ancient times in our karmic patterns, remember? Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. That Our destiny in this life is because in past lives we sowed an action. And that action has created tendencies and ha habits and tendencies and the character and the destiny. So we do have those pulls. But here in making these vows, what we are vowing to do is to offer up all those desires, offer up all those attachments, give them to God. Are they going to go away because we give them to God? I haven't found that true in my life. How many of you have found it true in your life that as soon as you say, oh, I give this to you, God, it's gone? <laughs> once in a while, once in a while that happens. But usually it's at the end of a long struggle to give up this particular, as Swami calls them, this particular little self-definition. The ego is just a bundle of self-definitions. So you try to give up this one, and you try, and you try, and you try. But that trying is extremely important because what are we doing in that trying? We're sowing an act. And when we sow that act of offering up all attachments, it forms the habit of doing that. And that habit forms a character of a renunciate. And that, because we're renouncing those desires and attachments, and that character of a renunciate forms a destiny. And what is the destiny? The destiny is to merge back into God. Because it's only those things. We're like a hot air balloon. We don't have to force ourselves to rise. We will rise. It's all those little threads of desires and attachments that are holding us to the rocks and the earth. As soon as they're cut, the balloon rises in and of itself. Yes, you have to have a little energy going. You have to have a little fire in your search. But you don't have to create the air, and you don't have to create the ability to rise. That's built in. The soul's nature is to rise into God. So offering up desires. I'll read a couple of other uh, facets of how Swamiji approaches that. For Tyagi and Brahmachari, I will retain no ego-gratifying goal in my life, but will strive always and above all to please God. For the Naya Swami, um, I will never take a partner 
or if I am married, will look upon my partner as belonging only to thee, Lord. Uh, that's kind of preparatory. In any case, I am complete in myself, and in myself will merge all the opposites of duality. I'm complete in myself. I don't need desires. I don't need attachments. And in myself, in my soul, I will merge all opposites of duality. I no longer exist as a separate entity, but offer my life unreservedly into thy great ocean of awareness. And for the sevakas, here again, it's, it's got the facet of it, of being uh, in this line of teachings and in this line of gurus. I promise as a member in Ananda's Sevaka order to live in surrender to God's will and to abide by both the letter and the spirit of the guidelines for living at Ananda. And so the Swami has written a whole little booklet about offering up those attachments and desires. So the offering up of attachments and desires is absolutely necessary. So now we've come, the purpose of life is to seek God. In order to do that, we must offer up attachments and desires. Next, he talks about uh, either possessions, which are also desires, or in this case, he talks about what kind of activity, what kind of service should we do. And for the pilgrim's vow, it says, I will strive to be an example to others of pure, discriminating, and noble life. I will offer the fruit of all my actions and labors to thee alone. So that sense of self-offering, of what we do, of our activity, is given only to God and not for our own benefit. This is one of the um, offering up the fruit of the labor is one of the absolutely basic parts of the teaching of the Bhagavad Gita, Nishkam Karma, that we do need to act. We do need to do what's karmically correct. But Nishkam Karma is to do that without a sense of attachment and without the expectation of getting back fruits. The action itself and the purification that takes place through that is fruit enough. Anything that we do that has a selfish motive, a selfish motive, what is it? It means a motive that benefits us as the delusive ego in spite of what it does to others. So any self-serving motive that we have puts a little twist and a little taint on that pure self-offering of our activity to God and to the world. And so here he's saying, I will offer the fruit of all my actions and labors to thee alone, Lord. Another, other ways that he states it is, I will offer to thee, Lord, my life, my desires, my attachments, and the fruit of my labors. For the Naya Swami states that I will feel that not only the fruit of my labor, but the labor itself is only thine. Act through me, Lord, always to accomplish thy design. I am free in thy joy and will rejoice forever in thy blissful presence. And for the sevakas, I dedicate myself to finding thee, my God, and to serving thee in a spirit of love through my fellow man, so that self-offering of our activity in a pure, open, generous way is the substance of our life. We have the purpose of life. We have the offering up of attachments. And then we have our daily activity, which is purely offered to God and, and offered to God in the form of all humanity. There was a beautiful, we saw a beautiful movie where a young boy in Tibet, a true uh, documentary, what was the name of it? Uh, Unmistaken. Unmistaken Child. 
because it was a documentary about the finding of a high lama who had died and then been reborn. And uh, so the child was about three years old and uh, when they found him and they were going to take him so that he could be raised in the monastery and trained properly. And the parents, of course, were, it was very difficult to give up their their son and have him taken away. And there was a, such a beautiful statement by the father. The father was weeping as he said it. He said, it's very difficult to do this, to offer my son in this way. But what choice do I have if his life can be a benefit to all sentient beings? And he offered up the son to be taken away. So our life should be of benefit to all sentient beings. And we should live in such a way that that becomes the whole focus of our activities. The less we think about what I get out of it, the less power that I has. And the whole purpose of these vows ultimately is to extinguish that sense of I that separates us. I no longer exist as a separate entity, but offer my life unreservedly into thy great ocean of awareness.